the next topic is again very very interesting because we are touching some of the aspects of digitalization and healthcare uh, that uh, today has been uh, uh, very much at the forefront of the news uh, mostly in the financial world and i'm talking about the blockchain the next presentation is about revolutionizing healthcare through blockchain technology. It's a presentation delivered to us by Pradeep Goel, who is the CEO of SolveCare in the United States. And Padre, uh, Pradeep uh, has uh, more than 25 years of healthcare experience, uh, developing software for the insurance industry. And previously, he was the founder and CEO uh, of uh, a health software firm called EngagePoint, where uh, he was uh, particularly involved in implementing the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, across multiple states. He was also the Chief Innovation Officer and Chief Information Officer at uh, Noridian Blue Cross Blue Shields in the US and uh, he co-founded Dakota Imaging in 1990. Uh, he has been named one of the 100 most promising entrepreneurs worldwide by Goldman Sachs. And so uh, certainly, uh, Pradeep, you have set the expectations very high for your presentation. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you to the stage and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to listening to your presentation. Thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, Marco, and hello, everyone. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to the presentations earlier. It's certainly an honor to be here. Um, I'm currently in our Kiev Development Center. So hello from, you, from Ukraine, although we are based in the US and Singapore as well. Um, I'm going to build upon much of what has been said earlier today. Uh, so my presentation today is really about the perspective of an insurance CIO that I used to be our government policymaker. Uh, and when we launched digital health solutions in the past, and we launched many of them with massive investment, we ran into a number of challenges that were fairly familiar and repetitive. And many of us are gonna run into them again as we really look to transform healthcare uh, to a digital model. I think it can be said safely that digitization of healthcare is upon us, driven and accelerated by COVID. The trend lines were there a long time ago but COVID really facilitated and accelerated and forced us to reckon with the fact that healthcare does need to be more democratized, more decentralized. So I'm gonna cover with you both the, some of the lessons learned of the past, as well as what we are doing at SolveCare to really build upon this um, transformation that has begun. And I presume you can see my deck. So let me dive into what our view is. Um, my fundamental view, based on having played the government role and the insurance executive role and the, pay, the um, patient role, of course, which we all play at some point in our lives, as well as an employer role, is that we are going to need to really focus on not just the process and the information delivery uh, of um, content using digital mechanisms. We are going to have to really transfer the power and control to the doctor and the patient in a manner that has not been often done. And if I can uh, refer to the presentation from the uh, gentleman from AXA, Sumesh, who talked about for adoption to be a great, uh, to be achieved, we're going to have to really make the digital health networks relevant. And that's really important. We use that word a lot. We make it, we try to make it relevant, but really the relevance um, drives adoption. And the other thing that drives adoption is their belief that whatever they're doing, whatever time they're investing in, whether it's a doctor or a patient, that time is going to bear long-term ROI. Um, I launched many, many, many digital solutions for my, my population, whether I was uh, dealing with my insured population, similar to AXA. We had um, a fairly large captive uh, population of, uh, in our state that we practically insured 93, 94% of the families. So I had a pretty cross-sectional view of all ages and all economic criteria and, and, uh, and demographics. And what we found inevitably in launching digital health applications, launching uh, um, mobile applications or portals or for the doctor or the patient community is that they did not adopt them beyond a very initial surge of interest. And why is that? Why does that happen again and again? And the reason is for patient is irrelevance and relevance can mean both in terms of functionality, but also is it really personal for me? Nobody really wants to get a generic um, healthcare um, uh, guideline. Everybody's situation is different and the needs change. Life is uh, life and health are continuously evolving uh, equation. 
So relevance, usability, concern about who's using my data and do, they, do I have control over it? And the biggest reason through, my, through our analysis was uh, solutions that are single purpose tend to have a very short uh, attention span for the patient. So we tried to solve problems like service uh, interoperability and uh, coordination of benefits, coordination of payment, coordination of care. We tried to build very complex uh, health information exchanges and health insurance exchanges. Many of them still function, uh, but none of them ever achieved the goal that was originally set. None of them achieved the ROI that we originally targeted. Far from it, a fraction, a fraction of the ROI was ever achieved. And I'm not talking about a single company. I'm looking across sectionally, US, China, India, Europe, we see the same issue. Uh, and I've had the advantage of having worked in many continents in executive roles in both insurer and government agencies. When we talk to the doctors, same issue. Administrative cost of adopting your solution is high. The ROI is uncertain and your solution only serves a narrow purpose. Whether it's a narrow set of my patients or it's a narrow set of my practice, I always am gonna end up having to switch screens and contexts to take care of chronic care versus palliative care versus preventative care. And that creates enormous burden for the doctor. And they ultimately say, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, as we say sometimes in the US. It's just too much effort for too little reward for me. And that's why providers tend to resist new solutions because they find it to be too narrow. And then from a payer point of view, and I've been in the payer state, and we use the word payer, I could say the word insurer, administrator, government agency, anyone who's writing the bill, uh, who's footing the bill for healthcare, like AXA, like uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, like um, many of the organizations that we saw mentioned in the previous presentation. For, for them, launching a digital health network is always a high risk endeavor. It requires tremendous upfront cost. You're not sure if you're gonna get the adoption pattern. The trend lines show lower adoption almost always. You gotta integrate a ton of services and continuously reintegrate them as services evolve. You wanna achieve coordination, but it requires a collaboration with a lot of third parties and compliance is always a concern. Are we doing something that can be deemed to be harmful to the patient or the doctor? Can it be seen as self-serving to the insurer and therefore we will get hit with you know, audit or with the worse lawsuit? These are the issues that plague or challenge rather every health initiative that at least I have encountered in the last 30 plus years of being in the healthcare space. So when I left Blue Cross, I started to ask the question, what would the future of healthcare look like? Why, when will we actually put the patient at the center of everything? When will we deliver personalized experience that's relevant to the patient's needs, not just today for the rest of their life? And I came up with a sort of a list of seven that I published in my own team. Um, um, and that drives a lot of our thinking today at SolveCare. And I want to share that with you, not because I'm here to sell SolveCare to anyone, but because I think it's, this is going to help entrepreneurs who are really trying to launch um, very important and very relevant solutions in the market. The first issue is trust. Uh, when you launch a digital health network or a digital health solution or a digital health application, the question is, who is the party who is using it expected to trust who is the ultimate sponsor and beneficiary of this network uh, or solution? And that trust is the single biggest barrier to adoption. I'll give you a very specific example. This may sound comical, but it's tragic, tragic comedy. Um, in my state in the US, we were given a huge amount of funding by the federal government to launch a health information exchange. The cost was somewhere around a quarter billion dollars. We went and bought the greatest technology. I got all the hospital CIOs in the room. I got all the major clinics in the room, the labs, the pharmacies. We spent weeks and months discussing the various rules of engagement. We bought all the fanciest technology money could buy. We had the fanciest consultants money could buy. And we built the health information exchange that I was pretty proud of having led as a techn technologist. But then time came to put the data on it for the hospitals to publish their data, for the doctors to consume that data, for me as a payer to be able to facilitate and coordinate care benefits and payments for my, pay, for my members. And we couldn't get anybody to put the data on. And the reason was that the hospital said, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't control this data once it leaves my control. This is proprietary information. If I'm here at Sanford and you over there at Mercy can see this information, you will take my patients away. 
doctors weren't willing to share the data from a liability perspective. They thought that I, as an insurer, would use that data against them, and so on and so forth. The bottom line is technology, while making things better, we need to rethink the whole concept of who are we trusting? Who is the patient and the doctor supposed to trust? And will they trust that person? And will they trust, trust that person in the long run? And the answer is no, they trust themselves. So we believe solutions need to empower patients and providers in a sovereign manner where they retain control over data and they retain control over actionability. And we as service providers subscribe to their data rather than collecting their data and analyzing it and trying to do the right thing for them. So we are flipping them. We believe the model needs to be flipped. The logic and the service needs to go meet the data in the patient's hand rather than data from the patient being collected in your, in your system and managed under your control, whoever you are, me as an insurer, you as a hospital system. Providers, um, so patient's autonomy and sovereignty has to be thought about if you really want global adoption. Providers need a much more effective model of practice. They are not gonna adopt solutions which add to their friction and cost and administrative overhead, or if they have to switch context all the time. So there has to be a way for the physician to have the, a highly efficient model of practice where we have to look at every keystroke, every extra step, every paper they have to push, every phone call they have to make to be able to practice medicine. And that has to be a key element. Whenever we put more burden on providers, they'll do it. They'll do it grudgingly if they see clinical value, but in the end, that is not gonna drive ubiquitous adoption that we're really looking for. Then we come to the payers, the insurers, which is who I am by training. As an insurer, I need to have visibility and control over cost, no doubt. I need to make sure utilization is correct and fair and appropriate. And I also wanna make sure my members get healthy as soon as possible so that I'm not looking to stymie care. In fact, I wanna coordinate their care, but I can be seen as a traffic cop who prevents or prohibits needed care. And the way you achieve that is by delegation of appropriate functions and decisions. Yes, you need control and visibility over cost and utilization, but you must delegate functions that you're positioned to do. Eligibility verification, pre-authorization, payment, uh, referrals, these things have to be delegated. The more we stick our finger in that, the more we are hated and the less efficient we are. And in the end, we spend 20, 30% of healthcare costs on administrative burden, which is not what we want. One big pro other problem in healthcare is payments are always, almost always uh, post-care and always delayed. There's a time gap. Uh, in the US, it's common for a doctor to wait 33 days to get paid from an insurer, up to 90 days to get paid from an insurer from a government agency. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable in all cases everywhere around the world. So we have to push the payment from this care and chase to care and get paid in real time and digital healthcare does help there. Second, uh, uh, last thing I'll say is quality control. As we move towards digital healthcare, we're going to need to incorporate completely different quality criteria than what we have built over the last 30 years in terms of, of care management. Almost all the quality standards worldwide are based on patient provider interaction that is not digital, that's in-person care. And, it, and that, that assumption is baked into quality metrics. If your solution needs to think about what the quality metrics are gonna be in the digital environment, and they're gonna be very different and you need to capture that so the quality can be measured. Because believe me, by end of this year, we're gonna be all asking the question, okay, telehealth is happening. Who the heck is managing the quality of telehealth? Are we measuring it? Are we comparing it? So all of that leads to an opportunity for companies that are looking to build a new paradigm of care. And we have banked our platform design on decentralization where trust and delegation and, and authority, uh, both in terms of payment and function and data control is in the hands of the actual network participant rather than the network operator. That's the key message I want you to take away. So having said that, we have built a little bit about soft care. Apologies if this is a little bit technical. We have built a complete blockchain-based solution which allows complete decentralization of data logic control and payment in healthcare to the actual stakeholder, the participant, the patient, the doctor, the pharmacy, the lab, the family member, the transportation driver working at Uber who's gonna take you to the doctor. These are network participants. These are the ones who are actually delivering care, not me, the insurance executive. And we have built a model that allows a complete and utter delegation of authority to all these people. And that creates a very, very different 
model of care in the digital world. Um, we are focused on autonomy of every stakeholder. They control absolutely 100% their data. They are sovereign in their ability to join and leave digital networks. They have absolute con consent control over everything. They coordinate their actions through its easy to use global app. And whatever they choose and whatever they receive is relevant. Nothing extraneous and nothing irrelevant appears in their wallet. And everything is highly personalized to their particular set of circumstances. And everything is highly encrypted in multiple ways. So this is what blockchain helped us achieve. We use blockchain for the auditability, immutability, the control distribution application function, but that's just the plumbing. What we really were after and what we have really built is a complete blockchain leveraging blockchain, a platform that allows for rapid deployment of digital health networks. We've launched five networks so far around the world. First one is a diabetes care coordination for, for adults. Second one is for medical necessity based transportation for both self pay and subsidized payment. The third one is provider, a real time provider payment system using digital currency. Fourth one is a COVID risk management and employee well being management uh, for, for both clinical and non-clinical uh, uh, staff. And the last but not the least is a global telehealth exchange, which is an open network for physicians worldwide to sign up and choose to define their practice in a manner that they see fit. Uh, and they can see any patient in any part of the world, depending upon the, the licenses and the liabilities they're willing to, to assume. Uh, all of this is run and controlled by a single care wallet, which is in the hands of every stakeholder. And using the wallet, you join the appropriate care network, you receive the appropriate care journeys, you maintain all your data in your care vault, you can create care circle with your friends and family. Um, cards are dynamic and unified. So basically the idea is that no matter what the solution is, whether it's clinical, administrative, financial, all of the above, the different cards appear to let you access your benefits and, and functions, and then the ability to access third-party products and services. In addition to all payments being digital, in the wallet and inside the network. So the Global Telehealth Exchange is a, is a great example of truly democratized healthcare. We do not claim to be the solution for everyone, for everything, but we do believe that a platform like ours allows anyone in the world to launch a digital health network that is relevant to their particular set of participants. Uh, and I'm more than happy to stay on and answer any questions off the, offline as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, for showing us uh, really what can be accomplished uh, uh, through uh, uh, blockchain in the space of healthcare. It was very, very interesting. I, I really appreciate it, Pradeep. Thank you for your time.